Hey, Tim Eccles back on Energy Matters for a very special event over at Clark Atlanta University. We're doing a, a STEM-related panel here today with some students. I did this at Savannah State. It went over really well. Trey Leslie and I organized it from Georgia Power. We got with, uh, with um, Professor Presley here, and we have set up uh, something here in Atlanta at Clark Atlanta, so I'm excited. Uh, Dr. Dix, welcome to our show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Dr. Dix, you and I will be on this panel today. I'll be talking about all things commission related, but you've done a lot uh, with automation, and we were talking before coming on air about uh, how autonomous things are just taking over, it seems, from the algorithms that run our grid, being able to aut autonomously curtail solar panels out in the field in the middle of South Georgia to the you know, to these Teslas and other cars that have some level of autonomous driving. Um, is, is autonomy and automation just something that's here to stay? Uh, yes, it's here to stay, and it has the propensity to make things more efficient, but the downside of it, it's going to eliminate jobs for millions of people. So you did your dissertation on this topic uh, up in South Carolina uh, where – uh, where you're from. Tell me a little bit about that dissertation. Um, the title of it is The Automation of Manufacturing, the Potential Effects on Rural Communities in South Carolina. Manufacturing is a big staple in South Carolina, and many of the areas are rurally based. So what happens is once these companies um, implement artif artificial intelligence and automation, you have many of the people that work in these facilities that only have a high school diploma. Those people, if they do not retrain, will not have a job. So that's the overall thesis of how automation is going to make the companies more money, but in the end, the employees are the major ones that lose and also the um, towns with the tax dollars and other factors that come into play. So does that mean we need to shun automation or do we just need to retrain folks to be able to supervise those robots? You need to retrain people, but if there's 500 people in a facility, with the invention of automation and the technology, you can eliminate 400 of those people and 100 people can run that facility. The question is, what do you do with the 400 people? Do they retrain? Do they not get a job? So the thing is to let people know this is coming. You have to retrain. Um, there are other elements of it, like advanced manufacturing and elements of it making tasks safer. But the overall consensus is you need to be aware of how this can impact your job and your families and et cetera. You know, we just landed a couple of really big economic development projects here in Georgia, the Hyundai plant, or as the Koreans say, Chundai mm -hmm. uh, plant in Savannah. That's going to be an electric car, an electric battery plant. We got the SK Innovations plant, another Korean facility, not too far from the South Carolina line in Commerce, Georgia, about 30 minutes from the border. And then the Rivian plant this coming. I mean, as I see the mock-ups for these plants, it seems like there's going to be a lot of robots. Yes. Um, we're in the pandemic. We're still in the phases of it. But we have to remember, with people not wanting to work, um, the pandemic caught, as we say, it caught companies with their pants down. They never want to seize production again. And with people wanting high minimum wages, I list that in my dissertation, that is a catalyst to use automation. Many of these robots in there are what they call collaborative robots. They will work with a human, but the overall consensus is robotics automation will rule those facilities. And they have to have people to know what to do, but you don't really need that many people in those big time facilities. I know for us, you know, when you think about a $5.3 billion plant, that's, you know, not counting all of the suppliers that are around it. It's an awfully big number uh you know and the per the jobs i mean it is going to be about eight thousand jobs so despite the fact that there's a lot of robots there's still a lot of jobs involved so i, I guess if i had to choose whether to have it or not i, I definitely want it coming and I, I guess i want the challenge of being able to help retrain the workforce to be able to work in collaboration with these robots? Uh, that is true, but that will come down to the company. Do they want collaboration robots in there? Um, like today, let's say I was talking with some of the students in there. You know, they were saying, well, they're excited to learn. Just think about the students we already have sitting in there. If those vacant seats or people that called in, the whole production operation ceases. Why they're implementing automation, they got to keep going. They don't need people to be able to call in. They don't need people just to do what they want to do. It's not a control mechanism. It's efficiency for the company. But the overall thesis is we are not going to stop production. You either learn with it, you help uh, make it better, 
or you find another job. And the key is people are going to say, I'll quit my job. Where are you going to get another job at? You know, as I was saying earlier, many of the people in South Carolina and rural areas of the United States only have a high school diploma. And education in the South, you know, if you talk to people, the first thing they think about, most people in the South are uneducated. Most of us only have a high school diploma or have no high school diploma. So now the thing is, how can you get a 45-year-old to go back to a technical school to learn about electrical circuits, integrated circuits, and uh, computer programming? I mean, it seems like we have a shortage of welders and sheet metal workers. And, I mean, these jobs out at Plant Vogel, right there on the Georgia-South Carolina line, these are... These are high paying jobs. Those welders at Plant Vogel make more than a history major coming out of the University of Georgia. So, but it's outside work. It's hot, not seasonal, but it's a little bit bulky. You're wearing all this stuff. It's not like you're sitting behind a desk in a suit and being all comfortable and everything. Well, that's one of the fields I push people to, um, blue collar. Many of the blue collar fields, you can't, they have um, autonomous robots or robots to help out. But one of the things is um, many of the blue collar fields, it's highly unlikely they'll automate many of those. It's very integral work. Um, You have HVAC, you have electrical, um, plumbing. You can't automate how to do those kinds of things. Yeah, do you anticipate more young people going into these blue collar um, jobs that you're suggesting? I mean, we've got a very robust union workforce, uh, UAW and the building and trades uh, uh, construction guys out at Plant Vogel. We're talking uh, about converting a lot of coal plants over to nuclear plants around the country. President Biden put in some incentives to, you know, to help that happen. It seems like as 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 we make this transition in our economy to a cleaner, greener economy, that it is going to provide some new opportunities. It will, but many kids have been sold the idea of sitting behind a desk makes you successful. Uh, many of the gen- I'm part of the millennial generation. I was born in '84, so many of the kids my age and uh, behind me have been sold that idea. Many of those kids do not like to work hard, so. Some of those kids going into a blue collar trade, which they can get into a union and make a lot of money. Some of them will go into it, but the American population has to sell them better on it because a lot of people think once you're dirty and smelling like oil and stuff, um, that doesn't make you a successful person. My dad had an auto paint body shop and I grew up on a farm. So that blue collar of learning, um, driving tractors, putting cars together, that really helped my life out on how to look at things differently and put things together. So it really, really has impacted my life greatly on the blue collar set of my career. My family owned a car auction not too far from here, and so I I started selling peanuts to car dealers when I was 11, and then I started buffing and waxing cars at age 15, and that was a very messy job because you had all those chemicals you were spraying on the car, and when you ran the buffer, it would throw that wax onto your shirt and to your face and into your hair. And so it didn't smell that bad, but I was coated with it, uh, and you couldn't get it off without getting in into a hot shower because it had dried by the time you got home. And then I worked in a hay field on my granddad's farm. I think all of that, Dr. Dix, helped me helped me see. Well, you know, I can I can smell like this and work like this the rest of my life, or I can go and get me a college degree and and increase my skill set and learn how to write better uh, and learn and, and and learn some things that you know that maybe I missed in high school. Well, um, from growing up on the farm and putting cars together and painting them, uh, my brother and I learning to do that, that really impacted my life, if I, life if I, as I stated earlier. And at times I really miss do driving tractors and working on the farm. Even though I have a white collar background, it's just something about being out in the environment, being out in the world, um, working with your hands. Even at the house, I know how to fix cars. So I still use that element. And there, they, there are things I carry from the blue collar thing of how to look at a um, diagram of electrical circuits or how to figure out things because a lot of the things people take time to figure out I cannot I don't really have to have a book I could just sit there and figure out how they work and just tinkering around as the old country thing says so um, I'm very proud that I have the blue collar background in my um, background. Hey, uh, we're with Dr. Patrick Dix. I'm at Clark Atlanta for a panel today. Just in the last minute or so, take me through you going to South Carolina State and then your master's and your doctorate because you certainly have you, you certainly have continued to learn and developed a, a, just a lifelong love for learning. 
Um, well, I majored in computer science at South Carolina State. We did Java programming, C Sharp, C++. Um, and then I went to Webster. It was on the campus of Fort Gordon, Fort Jackson in Columbia, South Carolina. So I had a full-time job where I was a programmer, and I drove one night a week to uh, do my MBA. And then I went to Robert Morris in Pittsburgh, but I had to fly up to Pittsburgh once a month to sit in class. I started that program in 2017 to 2020. So sitting in class, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we had to do two weeks a year. That was the journey. And before I started the program, I had an idea of what I wanted to do the research on. But when you have an advisor and a panel, you have to funnel the idea down. At first, it was the Southeast. Then we talked about other states, and I said, I got it. I'll focus on South Carolina. And that's where the idea came from to focus on automation in South Carolina because I have family members and people I know that will be greatly impacted by this type of uh, technology. Well, Dr. Dix, thanks for being on the show today, and thanks for being on the panel with me. You are more than welcome, and I appreciate you having me on. It's Tim Eccles on Energy Matters. Stick around another segment coming up. <laughs> 